extra. I, I I can do it. Yeah, I can I can pause it and stop it. So. Okay, so then it's on your computer recorded too. So we have a backup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, because sometimes I fall out. My internet is not really super great. So it is good that we have a backup. Hey, Karen, and you in the morning, you made it today. <laughs> you are, you yes, have... yes, I remember just set the alarm before I sat down to meditate. Uh, okay. Because <laughs> I do fall asleep sometimes. <laughs> can, can so what time, is it, what hmm? time is it for you, Heidi? Three? In the four o'clock four 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 in the afternoon. This month, next month, we are three weeks. At, uh. Uh, time zone confusion next mm. month for you the same time will be three o'clock for me yeah. okay no. okay i would say we are six people we can start and we do just a check-in you say whatever you want to say but uh, also <coughs> say what what is today on your you know what you would like to to talk about today so we we will figure out what to what to do okay who wants start? Okay, I'm always ready to jump in. Um, I'll start also because I'm leaving early today, about 15, 20 minutes early because I'm heading off to church. Mm -hmm. Some friends of mine are doing an early presentation and I'm helping them set up. And with this, I will briefly introduce one of my modest ambitions for Integral is I recently rejoined the Unitarian Universalist Church, which here in Berkeley is big and active. And as I said to Ryan, I aim to inoculate the doughy mass of Unitarian Universalism with the yeast of integral theory. Mm -hmm. um, I think they would, be, they would be tremendously receptive. And in fact, I've got a number of people in my church community who are very eager, and I'm an assistant to the wonderful woman who's head of the, quote, adult religious education and she is eager for me to be the link between Unitarian Universalist Church of Berkeley and Integral in the circle around Ken Wilbur. So I'm going to be helping design programs there for the adults. That's one of the things, one of the several things I'm up to. I see some thumbs up, yeah. So anyway, I, I will be checking out early today and that's why. And um, uh, I'd like to let other people check in, but I do have something I'm interested in picking up from last week's session, but I'd like to stop talking here. I want to interfere because it's some housekeeping I wanted to, to do. I wanted to ask every week somebody if they can take notes what we are talking about and more or less on what time. And when we started uh, punctually, so it's enough that you, uh, that who is taking on that um uh, writes down what what time it was and then we talk about for instance check ins until something is there anybody available to do that today Karen, I, yeah, nope. I, ordin ordinarily i'd be up for it but today's yeah, a little today you go away for, today, uh, yeah. but another day yes yeah okay somebody yeah, else? I, can, I can take a few notes yeah, i've got you. um one page left in my notebook, so. Very good. <laughs> you know, you don't have to write every detail, but when we touch the topic, then write at, uh, I don't know what your time is, 10, 15, we begin with topic, blah, blah, and then, you know, something like that. Because otherwise, for other people later, it's sort of useless what we have talked, because they wouldn't watch an hour and a half to find out what we talked about. So at least there is a little guideline, and when they are interested, then they watch it. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, also it occurs to me that if if one of us was willing to listen to the whole hour and a half later, um, this this could be done after the fact too, if necessary. Also, also. I do it already with three or four of my shows. So this week I have already done three. So it's, uh, you know, so I would like to distribute a little bit the, <laughs> the tasks. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Hey, Karen. Good morning. Nice to I'm see sorry. You. I, I apologize for being late again. My computer has crashed, and so I'm using my phone and downloading Zoom on the phone and dashing around trying to figure out what's wrong with my computer. <laughs> the computers. Yep. You know, when we don't have our computers working, life gets interesting, right? Yes. So, yeah. Karen, as you are unmuted, uh, do your check-in and say also what you would like to 
the conversation to be about today. And then at the end, we figure out what we do. Okay. Well, um, I don't have a particular goal in mind. It's just to connect. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm kind of distracted because of the computer, so I'm a little frustrated there. I, um, I did listen to uh, Jeff Salzman yesterday talk about uh, shadow at the higher stages in his conversation with Kim Barta. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be really interesting and, um, um, you know, learning how to, you know, the difference between 4.0 and 4.5 and his whole terminology mm -hmm. and learning how to integrate all parts of ourselves. And, and um, <laughs> this morning I would like to integrate that part of myself that's frustrated with the computer. So <laughs> I don't have a particular goal. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to check in, uh, jump in. Uh, I'm Ron from uh, New Hampshire. And um, I know I've come into the group late, uh, or late after this. And uh, um, thank you. And um, I want to thank you, um, thank you guys. Uh, the sending of the material um, in the, especially the part in the law, the lawyer part, the legal part, uh, I was able to pass that on to a um, colleague of mine that's very interested in Indigo, and he's interested in the getting into the legal system to um, bring in more an integral approach. And that whole material was a mind blast, so you might say, and he was excited. And he, he sends thanks and gratitude for sending that material. So uh, that, was, that, was, that, was, that itself was a great reward from the attendance uh, last week. Um, I think for me, it's about how to um, interface with people at different levels. Uh, of uh, where they are in the development. I have a friend that's um, uh, either regressed or I didn't know him well enough or wasn't aware of the differences uh, where he's a, uh, a Trump uh, ultra-right supporter. And um, it's really uh, caused a serious disconnect in the relationship in the sense that I don't know how to um, um, make a connection with him uh, where he's supporting a movement that would uh, make it illegal for me to get married uh, or might even um, require a re-educational camp for me to be sent to because of my sexual orientation. And uh, also I have a very um, strong allegiance with the black community and a member of uh, Trump um, wanting the four adolescent black uh, males murdered by the state uh, and, and on and on with that. So, so what I'm saying is, is how do I maintain a relationship with people at different levels or is it just only I can mm. stay at a casual level? So that I would find interesting, you know, um, you know um, and it's really in doing couples work, um, running into couples that um, one person, especially on the male side, and maybe showing some prejudice there, uh, seems to be in a traditional mode where the uh, female partner tends to be at least at uh, achievement and rational level, uh, if not even at the postmodern of uh, being in touch with the feelings and uh, the, the uh, universal support of equality and respect for all and so forth. Um, how do you work? How do you work with that? I mean, uh, so that would be kind of an area that I find I have a real I'm kind of jammed up on. So to hear you guys' perspectives on that would be, I'm sure, very helpful for me, for sure. Anyway, that's that's my thing. I'm taking notes. I think these are topics which would fill every one of them a whole session. So maybe we can decide on what to do and, and maybe cue them, cue, make a cue of what to do when, you know? Okay. And, um, I feel a little bit akin to what Ronald was kind of talking about, about working with other levels and all this kind of stuff. Um, I feel like the, I said this last time, that the calls kind of validate a lot of my integral experience. And I kind of, I think this week I had, like it was fantastic on the one side, and then the other side of it was really quite difficult, I think, actually trying to uh, be with my um, 
it, what felt like kind of higher perceptions and the, the stuff I struggled with is more on the kind of ambiguous feelings level. But I've had loads of like being really interested in uh, the games industry, games development, and kind of feeling like a uh, a sponge for like all this incredible stuff that um, is out there, opinions, games, all this kind of stuff, and trying to navigate like all the different levels and trying to appreciate um, what some of these views are or what the game uh, is coming at. And I find that, um, I don't know, There's it's a lot more fun and enjoyable for me when I'm honoring my integral capacities because if I don't do that, I feel like I get disorientated and almost like shamed of uh, that I don't fit in rather than actually seeing that as I start to pull lots of uh, people's resources that I can feel myself kind of integrating it into something higher. Um, and part of that is I think also I, I work on two teams um, that are working, they're trying to work in a, a game. And it's funny like to see the levels at play because one is I think very like highly skilled, I think probably at green and it feels like a very healthy, um, passionate environment. And then another one is just a bit crazy. Like there's a lot of um, kind of revolutionary ideas. So I find it actually quite hard to map. But then one of the leaders is like, there's like loads of red kind of thing and like ego. And part of me loves that because it's kind of, there's a trailblazer, but then there's this narcissism to it. Um, and I think that probably relates to some of my inner experience of difficulty like i i struggle with my my body like i have uh, the sort of body image bdd and trying to navigate like health systems or uh, the feelings of being my body and i think there's something for me about red that i struggle to integrate but um there's just i i guess i guess like my experience of the week was just realizing sometimes integrate its best like you are just you can integrate so much it can almost be like overwhelming, like intellectually, energetically, um, all this kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Um, I can go next, but I also noticed, Karen, you lit up with agreement around something with the integrating red. And Chris, if you could say maybe a sentence about why you're excited. Oh, yes. Uh, one of the huge issues of my life is integrating red. And this is the other big thing I'm doing. I'm writing an integral novel. Uh, Ryan interviewed me about that on his Talking with Teal. This is, um, and integrating red, the red barbarian. Um, that red barbarian wants to come up out of the shadow. And this came up powerfully with me in the, this is more than one sentence, sorry. I went to the uh, What Now conference in Denver over a year ago with Ken Wilbur and all the others. And I bookended that conference with excited burbles about that red that I've been working with, my own red barbarian and my third chakra because he's the villain protagonist in my novel. And he wants to come out of the shadows culturally as well as in the individuals. That is, Green has cast him out into the outer darkness. And he wants to come back and join our integral party. So a big part of my life, Paul, is about precisely that issue over and out. Great. And Thank you. Yeah, Natalie, yeah. can you say a little more? <laughs> because you didn't. Yeah, you... definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I also resonate with the integrating red and have a lot to say and, and ask and share. Um, but um, what I'm coming to the meeting today with is um, I'm giving a talk um, for the American Fisheries Society uh, in just a couple weeks um, in Oregon, here in the States. And um, the topic is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I've been watching some of the talks that people have given at other conferences on similar topics for the fisheries uh, and rivers um, conservation work. And I'm wanting to get really clear about um, some of the language to describe the difference between the inclusivity of green and the inclusivity of teal. And have some ideas and things that I've made notes of, but would love to have a conversation about that while I'm writing my talk. Thank you. Sounds interesting, too. Yeah, all, all really wonderful topics everyone uh, suggested. 
I just want to say too that I'm babysitting a puppy, so I'm kind of that's I'm kind of like looking around to make sure <laughs> she doesn't like. She recently chewed up my computer cord. I had to buy a new one, uh, mm-hmm. so I'm really hyper vigilant that she doesn't like get into anything weird. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but uh, yeah, wonderful topics. Um, integrating red. That's that's uh, you know red. That's my that's my cup of tea. I I taught boxing and martial arts for many years in Hawaii, so red is uh, probably one of my best friends, and um, also play a lot of sports. Um, and also, uh, I think the topic that Ron had suggested, I, I also have a, a friend who is a big time uh, alt-right uh, Trump supporter who, actually, who recently uh, discovered Jordan Peterson. So I'm, I'm, fa- I'm happy that he uh, switched to that. <laughs> and um, uh, funny how that works sometimes. And so, yeah, I, it, that's also an interesting topic for me is, is how to talk to different people. And, and um, I have my own... I don't, I don't see this friend very often, maybe like three times a year, but when we do talk, it's always very fun and very engaging. And he has, he has an issue with red. Um, and I think he's going into orange. He's a friend from college. Uh, so we definitely have really interesting uh, discussions and it's usually just me probing into him and interrogating him, but he's very good at taking criticism. And, and every time I point out his blind spots or his fallacies in his thinking, he's very appreciative. Um, so that may be different from what your relationship is like with uh, the person you're mentioning, but uh, yeah, that's something I'd be interested in exploring more. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I would be interested, but uh, maybe you, you, I don't know. Did you listen to the last um, talk of Jeff Sussman? It was about extraterrestrials and that finally Integral uh, is allowing that maybe in this huge universe and these multiple universes that maybe there are some human-like or at least life forms and that we are not the only one on the earth. And I found that very interesting because so far I met, I also talking with Jeff, I, I met something which I call Integral Conservatism which uh, what cannot be, cannot be, even in, on the integral level, you know. And so I see an opening into, um, into something which so far you couldn't believe it. So that would also be interesting. But in both um, talks of Jeff, you would need to have uh, listened to them. No, uh, I don't know who said it. Karen, you said it, I think, about Jeff. I haven't listened to that uh, specific one, but we could we could do extra uh, talks with these topics, and then we agree on uh, listen to the talk, and then we we talk about it. Is it okay? I'm really interested in that. Um, I did listen to that same talk with Kim Bart um, mm-hmm. a while back when it first came out, and it's a little foggy now. Would love to listen to it again and have a conversation another time. Um, and. Also noteworthy is I'm starting to study with Kim Barta, um, like through some of his workshops and shadow trainings and stuff. So there's a lot of juice there. Yeah. Yes, I was just listening to it before um, the call this morning and talking about integrating bread. So um, yesterday I was walking and uh, my dog had caught her eating some poop. And the red part of me, and this is her, her goal in life is to be able to do that. And the red part of me just got so upset. I didn't didn't act out on her or anything, but um, it's been a while since that part has come up. And I just love that we're we're talking about this, and that Karen uh, in California talking about integrating red and how it wants to come up out of the shadow. And um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I hear the word red, I heard a lot uh, today so I would think that might lead us into the topic of today (laughs) seems to be the most named word in our uh, uh, is it okay that we talk about that and we can also talk about the how to talk with the people for instance in red I did in in but in German language I did five or six uh, conversations about exactly this topic how you can recognize uh, people uh, where they are at by what they what they talk about, how they talk, and also how we can help them, you know. And only on Friday we did the last one. It was about till about second tier, so it was always interesting. But as you don't probably know German, it doesn't help you. But we could do that also in English. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. I like I, I like my red red pot um, when it comes to protecting my dog. We have a bully here on the um, the condo complex, and I think he's very scared of my dog. He is a little dog, mm -hmm. and um, he really gets insulted with me and all that. And he threatened my dog uh, one day, and I uh, put the leash leash um, handle right in his face. And I said, "Don't you ever threaten my dog again." or are you going to pay dearly for it, you know? And I said, and not only that, I want you to shut the effing up because whatever you say is just insane. And <laughs> he, he, I had no trouble with him since, since it's been over a year ago. Uh, but so, but the, what I like about it, is I don't have the uh, red coming out on politics or people having different views with me, which I used to, uh, you know, so some way get integrated and I think it's from the shadow work, you know, because I had a lot of rage in my history. And I think once we mm. clean some of that up, some way slot up that red pot, I feel like it's kind of manageable. You know what I mean? So I, so, so I can definitely relate to how that can be an issue still for, for people. Uh, I think it's also especially a question for a problem, let's say, for women, because we, for thousands of years, were educated not to show that at least, not to live it. And we did it in other ways, you know, we did it like yeah. manipulation. So to be openly read in the sense to, to be angry, normally we had the substitute emotion of sadness instead. So um, I think we have to do something especially, but maybe the younger generation, we can ask Natalie, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, that, um, what were you saying, Heidi, stands out that um, I've been exploring how um, women tend to uh, substitute the actual feeling of anger with sadness, and men tend to substitute the actual feeling of sadness with anger. And yeah. that's, of course, a very gross generalization and more along the lines of masculine and feminine situations. But um, um, and another thought that I have is uh, in so many integral communities, there's the... Um, desire to help people evolve, to help them move up the chain. And I feel um, passionate about supporting people and becoming healthy about where, whatever level they're in. And it feels actually like a green perspective to try to evolve people um, and not accept them where they're at, where we're wanting them to have our level of inclusivity. And that's just not always possible and it's going to set us up for a very unhappy life if we're trying to do something that is never going to be successful in the full spectrum of the world because there will always be people at red and blue and and so on but how can we understand the values that people have wherever they're at and be able to actually us like heal our shadow like you were saying Ron um, to be able to feel comfortable with being with red that that feels more like the integral work. I have a I have something on that which I I mentioned before, which is like sometimes I get this sense in integral that there is this green quality of like almost rose tinted glasses through all the the lower levels, and this kind of lacking voice of like what what if a certain person is just being pathological, like they kind of need a bit of a slap upside the head or they need kind of. Um, containing like I had a guy yesterday who he's being red some of his his red is great and I was thinking am I going to bang my head against the wall trying to make somebody evolve or is there an ability to meet his red to have him be more healthy to be less of a narcissistic maniac that was kind of destroying the thing um, and funny when Natalie when you're talking about the thing of substitute or Heidi as well like substituting um, anger for sadness because I feel like that so often happens with greens um, I think greens in some ways is quite a very feminine way but it's like I so often see it, the, this like huge lack of anger and sort of sinking into this kind of um, accepting helpless sadness that at times just like makes no sense and there's like there's no um, protective clout there to be found that's my experience anyway Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Red can be wonderful too. It is one part of the spectrum. And this is one of Ken Wilber's great contributions that every level is a necessary part. Um, we don't want to leave out any part of the spectrum. Um, the positive side of red is that wonderful energy that asserts itself and it can be in a very joyful way like the, the dancing the energy that says yes let's do this um I, the issue is healthy versus unhealthy at every level as natalie just said and i'll just jump on the last thing i think paul was saying i mean there i see a lot of toxic red in green and ken wilber had a whole lot to say about that and especially in boomeritis um, that the, there can be the suppression of red where you just lack the energy and you sink into this morass because red is that energy that asserts itself. Um, otherwise, we just be kind of, <laughs> we just kind of be this, these, these puddles. Um, where it's toxic in green, it's the other side of the toxic red that I see so much of in the green level besides the kind of passivity and sadness is when red is toxic. It is this kind of disavowed anger that comes out sideways, like Heidi was saying, and in the, the, the deconstructionism, where it's seeing red everywhere, but in me it's projected. And so you see any structure or any kind of, of anything that you disagree with is actually a, mm. a, an evil means by some, that person I'm projecting on there, they're out to dominate in some way. So you see dominator hierarchies everywhere you look and, and at the extreme, the, the deconstructionist extreme, any structure or any kind of hierarchy is an evil power plot on the part of some power people who want to rule us, everybody, and oppress us. So you see oppression and, and domination everywhere out there and anything you don't like or don't want to have to deal with you're, so so there, there is this tox, a lot of toxic red in the dysfunctional parts of green today that gets projected out. So that, that's kind of the other side of the toxic red in our green levels. I think there's also a little bit to add to green as well, which I think there's, um, with all the emotional exploration of feelings, there's just this narcissism around that to the point, like there, there can be a celebration of anger in green, but it's kind of like a... Um, it's a bit weird, like my anger, I'm arbitrarily angry or there's some celebration at that. And also I see it in like the world can be changed. Like if I look at the university situation, like trigger warnings and all this kind of stuff, it's like, you know, you have to cater to every single thing. If there's murder in the Bible or something like that, then I need to be uh, put into this, this little bubble or you need to know my, you know, these pronouns that get to the level of like there's 200 and they don't make any sense. And my sub my subject uh, subjectivity rules um that, that can be a huge thing with green yeah i want to say something to that too in my birth town we have for hundreds of years a uh, negro we called that negro had in our um stemma what is it in the in the um, the the oh god how do you say that in english the the symbol of the city you know, uh, the, which is everywhere, no? like your, your profile picture of the city. And that's for 100 years. And now you couldn't put a Negro there anymore, you know. So it's all so, so strange, you know, as if history, uh, that, that was a saint, you know, which came into this position in our city. But for me, sometimes it's really super, super crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been doing some of my own inner work with red lately, and what, what comes to mind of what healthy red is, is the desire to protect. And um, for myself, uh, through layers of shadow work with uh, the image story of I'm doing it wrong or you're doing it wrong, and then working through layers into the giving and receiving and how, how that dynamic works down into, I don't know how to protect myself sometimes. And the vulnerability that came landing there and also the, the strength that I felt even in that like little girl 
um, that was scared when she was an infant um, with her mother. And, um, and so a healing process that I've, an image, like an archetype that I've used to work with it is um, to protect that, that sweetness in me of whatever age with, with a gorilla. The way the gorilla is just so sweet and tender for her babies, but is willing to say, no, not that, not right now. It's not wrong what you're doing, but just not now in this way um, with, with a tender fierceness. Um, to me, that archetype paints a healthy red of tenderness and protectivity. Yeah, yeah. Natalie, my, my equivalent for that is a tiger <laughs> overnight. <laughs> I, I like that concept of the protection, uh, like I was doing with, with my dog. Um, and then the other thing that was coming in on me uh, as I heard you guys speaking was that um, how do I know if I'm in a um, uh, good place with the red or how did I know? And I think it was because uh, I like the concept about um, include. So I, you know, I reclaimed that part of me that can be that way as a protective response. And then I walked away not being angry at the, at the uh, bully. Uh, which really then felt like it was back in my own wherever I'm at, whether it's postmodern or hopefully eventually <laughs> more integral. Uh, but I mean, I just knew I was in a, a, a more wholesome place. You know what I mean? And, and that was very helpful when you said uh, about protective response versus when during the election, both candidates in the United States, the uh, Trump and Hillary Clinton, both triggered rage in me because I have a history of both being you know, raped by a priest and being uh, assaulted by a nun uh, at a very early age. So both of them trigger those um, core, you know, wounded spots in me. And once I worked through those, then I was fine with both of them. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm not, I mean, fine is probably not getting reacted uh, uh, with red. Yeah, um, one thing that I, I enjoy doing is <clears throat> for working at red is I like to see how sports coaches deal with red on their teams. And you can get a lot of good insight from football uh, coaches or basketball. And so one of the things that the best coaches do like Steve Kerr from the golden state warriors, uh, Phil Jackson, who coached Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, Bill Belichick on the Patriots. What they, well, I think what they realize with red players is that they play a very important role on the team. And that is that, they prevent the team from getting complacent because their energy and their ego power is so strong. It, it has a kind of a disruptive quality. And so it prevents stagnation, especially when teams are very successful and they have, they've won a championship two or three times in a row. You get complacent after a while. And the red guy's ego is insatiable. And so that keeps the team. Mo so usually they'll, they'll be delegated as like the team cheerleader uh, to try to pump people up and, you know, give the pregame speech of like yelling at people, getting all fired up for the game. And if you don't have that guy, that firecracker kind of a character, you can get really uh, complacent. But one of the things I, I like to think about too is how for every stage, not only red, I think there's an, there's a, there's just the expression of the stage, right? Like an expression of red, if you get into an argument with someone and then there's an integral expression or a second tier integrated expression of that stage, and for me, when I was a kid, I had a very hard time with the red <clears throat> because of how my parents raised me not to be red. And I got into boxing and <clears throat> excuse me, martial arts and stuff as a teenager. Um, and when I started to become comfortable with the red, I, it became a joyful confrontation. Like confronting people became a joyful and exciting uh, and uplifting activity and I had to learn also that it wasn't always like that for the other person <laughs> it was you know so I had, to, I had to be careful not to uh, steamroll people but what I noticed was that the anger or the more pathological aspects of red that were present in me were filling a void it was filling a void of being unable to do something uh, so once I was able to have a confrontation or, or or perform the function of what red would do assert my ego or assert myself in some way from an integral standpoint, it would be a joyful, uplifting, and energizing activity where I could feel that effulgence of happiness rising in me. And it wouldn't be this angry, confrontational, dominator, hierarchy kind of a, a projection. So that's, that's kind of been my experience with trying to transform that red consciousness in me. 
I appreciate. I was. I was just going to talk about um, when Natalie was talking about protective activity because I think that was a huge thing. And then Ryan, you touched on it, which is this thing of fighting and um, actually doing something. Like I feel like, and I've I've had this with greens, even with therapists. Like Red's really like messed me up being with a really green therapist. Like having all this rage. Like I, I feel like something that comes with integral is like really wanting to do something in the world. And I feel like there's no way you can do that without Red. Um, and also, Ryan, when you were touching about uh, like martial arts and sport, like there's something about fighting and enjoying it. Like I was thinking of um, when you're talking about red in a, in a in a team player, like Michael Jordan he used to have this massive red. Like some of it was kind of started unhealthy and it kind of needed coaching, but there was always this drive to be con competitive. And it's something I'm kind of enjoying about the games industry because the games industry is kind of dominated by red as well. There's so many power dynamics like one of the biggest um probably genres is just like first person shooting so it's just people going around trying to kill each other and be teamwork and there's this like real beauty about that but there's also like a, a limitation because it seems to be kind of locked in there like they could do with kind of expanding it up to higher levels um and also the thing you said about and i think this is true of any level like uh, i think the the other levels kind of express themselves differently depending on your hierarchy like there's pure red back in barbarian days and then there's red that's expressing itself in orange and green and in integrals and it's amazing like we, we sort of touched on how red expresses itself in green like how different a level can express itself when it's armed with another level hmm. yes when it's integrated Yes, my, my, what red has done for me in more recent years is it's filled my life with energy. I was raised to not, not only not express my feelings, it was, was not even okay to feel them. And I'm one of my excellent mother's unfortunate uh, uh, ways of being a parent was to say, and wipe that expression off your face after she disciplined me, you know, mm. not even okay to feel it. And so um, for that and other reasons, I have had two severe depressive episodes in my life. And that is, um, and getting back in touch with my own red, which I've done later on, has put me back in touch with that energy, that upsurging energy. And it is ego, it is narcissist. It's and in the developmental scale, and I'm a historian, you know, where the red comes in with, so, you know, with, with agriculture, really. It's the first sense that I exist as an individual. At the lower two levels, you're still, your identity is still fused with your tribe or just with nature. Um, that red is that sense, I exist as a separate being and I am going to express myself in the world. And it is in itself narcissistic. It needs the upper levels to get those higher senses of, well, I'm a part of a community. Well, there are higher forms of expressing myself. I can express myself through games, through sports. And that's kind of the, um, not so much the taming of red because we don't want to tame it or tamp it down, but channel it into appropriate ways that contribute because red loves to contribute. It loves to protect. And Natalie, that's what you were saying. It is that ferocious warrior who will sacrifice his life, who will put himself on the front line. It's the warrior who will go out there to Afghanistan or, you know, wherever and just sacrifice his or her life for the sake of the tribe. It's the, it can be ferociously loyal. So it's, it, it's joy is in serving life. And I think that's probably true of every level that the real joy is in serving the larger picture. And, um, and I think this part, of, part of how we have handled red as we've collectively moved up the, the levels in civilization is through sports games. And I did a bit of martial arts too, Ryan, by the way. And, and, and through the gaming industry um, in its cruder forms, I mean, it, that can be done in a way that um, does not serve the health of the individual either. But we can, we can take an excess of red and channel it right into that video game. I need to kill something, blam or sports and cheering our team. But red really at its fundamental is healthy, it's necessary, and it loves to serve life. So for me comes the question if there is, and I think there is a difference between Europe and America, because you have a different uh, way of, of 
uh, going through the spiral. And I think um, part of the very unhealthy blue, in, at least in Germany, but also in other northern countries, I would say, maybe not so much in, yeah, I don't know how it's in South Europe, but in Germany for sure, it was really to suppress red. And it was the, the, um, the attempt to break a child's will, a child's, let's say, identity uh, to educate it. That was how they uh, understood education. And the Nazi education book was still in print until the 70s. So you can imagine how um, it is difficult to reintegrate uh, red. I mean, f maybe for men it's even easier because they go to do soccer and all these sports, you know, they, they can get it out. But I think for women it's still more difficult because they're more like uh, frustrated, bitter, at least of my generation, you know, and not, uh, and I feel it in me too. I, I haven't integrated well the red. I should go out and do things much more actively. And at the moment, I, I don't feel like it, apart on online, I do something. But it is still uh, this conditioning that you are egocentric if you do things like that, and that's not good. And you have to be, you know, in your box and be obedient and a nice girl. And I see that at least up to a certain point and in certain levels uh, of uh, let's say German population, that's still quite quite the case. So I would be wondering how that is in, in America, if this is the same, I cannot imagine. You didn't have this military drill, which yeah, we had. Not to, no. not to that level. And before the Nazis, I mean, through the 1900s, uh, the way Germans brought up children, especially in Northern Germany was horrific. And you're right. I mean, we never had it in in the, in North America to that degree where you have to break the child's will. The child is a monster of selfishness, and it's it's a bar it is a barbarian, and you must break that and make it obedient. And we, we never had it to that degree. But well, we do have in America the uh, what I see is the emergence of what Germany went through. Uh, we have um, uncontrollable uh, red being led right from the presidency all the way down through by the Christian right, you know, and the neo-Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan, a thousand um, militant, radical, right-wing, ultra-right um, that perpetrate hate and just uncontrollable rage because um, people like myself more getting shot in the streets uh, for being gay and so forth and so that, um, Uncontrollable red, to me, is another issue of how do you cope with when you see that manifesting with some of the friends around you um, that are getting caught up in that. Um, what, what do you do with that? You know what I mean? And maybe this is not the right group to ask that question. I don't know. Oh, uh, well, really, really quickly, um, just to uh, echo what you're saying, Ronald. It's interesting, I think, too, because there's like the German manifestation <clears throat> and then there's, you know, you're talking about North American problems and from Hawaii, the, the Hawaii red is interesting because in a lot of ways it, it really is red from like 2000 years ago. <laughs> like there still is this kind of indigenous tribal one. Okay. So when I first went to high school, public high school, the second day of school, I walked onto the parking lot and there were literally like 30 or 40 people, high school students and police officers having a full on melee fist fight in the parking lot. People were rolling on the ground, like fighting each other. Uh, so I, I dropped out of high school after a month, but the, the, um, I found out what was happening was it was an ancient uh, family feud between two different Hawaiian clans <laughs> that was playing out in my high school. And that's like normal, right? Like you just like walk down the street, you know, like, there, there's a lot of very tribal red in Hawaii. There's the whole Hawaiian sovereignty movement where they want to uh, leave the United States and become an autonomous kingdom of Hawaii back to the days of King Kamehameha III. And so it's like th that, that red culture is really in your face, but it's, again, it's a very different manifestation than green, you know, mm -hmm. postmodern social justice red or uh, mm -hmm. like Christian alt-right red, because it's like, it really is like straight from the tribal <laughs> uh, kind of environment.
And I guess one of my questions I have is how do we deliberately work with the red? And one of the things I've done is I've deliberately gone to different kind of discussion groups and different kind of places like meetup groups just to argue with people and practice in, in that kind of environment. And I have uh, several friends, one of them how I was mentioning earlier, who's a, a fan of the Milo Yiannopoulos and the alt-right. And I have several friends where all that we do is we, we, we put in a date, like, okay, once a month, like Tuesday, we're gonna talk, we, we, just, we just choose topics to argue about. And you know, I, 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 I doesn't matter what position I take, I'll just take whatever argue, position that they're you know, against, <laughs> uh, just to practice. And, and I've noticed after doing that over time, you know, when I first started doing that, I was like really nervous and I felt really uncomfortable. And then after a while, it becomes really fun and kind of like an elating experience. Um, so, so just putting myself in that kind of situation over and over and over um, or going to the boxing gym and just sparring people over, it's, after a while, I think you kind of start to integrate that red. And then even if you're talking to people who are genuinely at a red center of gravity, you can meet them with your teal version of red, right? You can meet them with an integrated expression of red. And, and that tends to be a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I, it's something I, I would, yeah, uh, kind of like a don't try us at home kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, I think it'll take some refinement, but um, it's something that's been helpful for myself. Yes, red loves a party and, and a good fight come, is part of the joy of life when it's like that. And when it's part of fun sparring with your best friend in the ring, but you're really out there to win but you're really enjoying the engagement. So for people who are up for it, that is definitely one way to engage red is to make it fun for them. Red loves that back and forth. It doesn't have to be hostile and angry. It can be fun and exuberance. Red, unless there's a life and death issue at stake, red loves that kind of engagement. Not everybody's up for that. I don't engage at that level so much. Um, for me, the red is more the self-protective thing where another way. So I'm going to take another way to engage red constructively, productively is to give it something it loves to defend. And that's Natalie's position. Red loves to be the hero. It will put itself out there for what it loves and cares about. So presenting an issue in a way that strike, that makes sense to them, that they are protecting something they love and cherish. Give them a, something, give them a value that they connect with. Like the step up for red is into, what is it, green? I, I mean, the spiral dynamics, the heart center, the community, the beloved community. And this is what the heroine in my novel is wrestling with because this is 11,000 years ago. And that's where I'm trying to kind of engage this historically. Um, the, this barbarian, this is a step up from the tribalism that you were talking about, Ryan, where it's my tribe versus your tribe and everybody else is an other. And how do you step up from that? You create a community through the new gods and goddesses and rituals and songs mm -hmm. and plug that red tri raw tribalism into the beloved community and protecting the beloved community. And this is that that and this is this is such joy for the raw red to have some greater meaning for life something that gives life meaning it's not just nature red in tooth and claw there's the beloved community now and i will live and die for this so gladly so that's another way to engage the red is to um present a larger kind of some larger community or some larger value in a way that is meaningful to them um, that, that could be the ultimate joy for somebody who is, is trapped in raw red. So when I hear you speak this way, I always hear it as if you speak to, to male uh, red. I don't see yet the female red. The female red, yeah, when they have little children, uh, the females are, you know, defending the children. But the other forms of red, a nice fight, I don't know. I really don't know how, how the female way is to, to, to express a healthy red. Could I like say something on the gender okay. thing as well? Because I think, um, I think greens really slammed a lot of male red, like in a really, really bad way. Like um, Warren Fowler's come out with, uh, which am I thinking of, the boy crisis. So he talks a lot about how fathers contain boundaries and like actually allow play because if you have boundaries, people can be more intense and they can wrestle and like nobody gets hurt. Um, like 
Salzman did a thing on is uh, masculinity toxic. So they were talking about the Gillette advert, which I feel like really compounded lots of stuff. Like you have two kids who are really, in my opinion anyway, kind of just play fighting. And that's being muddled with toxic masculinity. And uh, what's his name? The Hollywood guy that's wine, uh, whoever it is with all the sexual allegations and all this kind of stuff. And then you have like loads of young boys being put on Ritalin and things in school because they have too much energy. Um, so it's kind of, I don't know, it's, I, I feel like both genders kind of get it. And, and in some ways I see feminism has quite a lot of red, but it seems to be, there's a lot of like narcissism and just like rah, rah, women do what they want just for the sake of it, almost just stuck in um, very puritanical red. You know, and for me, this red is a sort of victimism um, defense. It is a, a, a sort of, you know, being entitled to, to fight because we are victims. So that's for sure not a healthy red, at least in my opinion. This is a sort of very distorted red. Yeah, I, th I think the Me Too movement in, in the United States uh, is, is a... Um, the way I see it is a way of women legitimizing the right to be angry of how they've been um, um, mis you know, uh, treated by male on the sexual side and to uh, seek justice with that. Like with Dr. Ford, to me, she won the day she decided to uh, ch challenge that candidate by um, sharing what, what she had experienced with him uh, years back. And to me, that was a good way of processing the anger because I'm a uh, rape survivor. And so I can identify and relate. And, and the red card does come out, I think, when, when we um, stand up and say, no more will I tolerate that kind of uh, overextension from a person. Mm. And to me, that is a uh, way that I think women uh, are processing their legitimate anger uh, and rage. There's something that I'm noticing about the red also where um, we can assert our boundaries or assert something that's valuable to us but also be receptive to when um, something that we agree with is on the table rather than just saying no, 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 continually. And um, for example, uh, some friends of mine, they get together to debate um, which Disney movie is better. <laughs> and they have tournaments around this. And I noticed that though my friend um, has a lot of like red in him, when I bring something to the table because he's had so much practice debating he'll he's able to say oh yes that's a good point and and then point it in a new direction rather than just no you're wrong and i'm going to stick to my argument and that's the only thing that rules yeah. and that's maybe something that i is happening in um some of the other movements like me too or things like that will become uh uniformly defensive rather than permeably protective mm. And that's like a feminine component. And I wanted to jump in on just the, um, the uh, what came to my mind when you're talking about uh, what, what we call in, in American culture, the butting heads. I, I like that. If you get people, you know, with, a, with red back and forth, the butting of heads or the symbol of the ram, you know, the ram on the mountain, you know, they butt heads, you know, and then walk away as friends. You know, the same thing in Zen, uh, it's, I forgot what it's called when I was in training with Zen, uh, but it's where you um, have real intense arguments, you're butting back and forth with each other, and then you shake hands uh, afterward. So that's why I like what you're saying about that engagement of, um, you know, with people that are uh, open to it. Uh, that sounds like a very healthy way of uh, um, owning that part of us, you know, uh, I feel like that that kind of um, I was just thinking about the fact that it's so natural as well like competition is such a huge part of the natural system and the way that it it like empowers everybody like you know when Michael Jordan is kind of like chipping everybody down and wanting to be the best like it's kind of it's a driver to make um, everybody else improve and I see that in the games industry as well like people just like work their ass off on this game and are insane and it made me think uh, Karen when you were talking about taking red to blue it kind of gave me a little bit of pride because there's certain like 
and it probably does go more to the the male kind of like archetype but there's a lot of beautiful archetypes in the games industry like one of the oldest games is like mario which is essentially like the start of the story is some princess uh gets taken away so he has to go and rescue the damsel in distress and there's usually always like some kind of grand picture that is supposed to motivate the players like i think they could probably do a better job of that to be honest because i think sometimes it's actually not that motivating but like i, I just found the the thing you're pointing out about taking it to blue i found my own spark of like oh yeah if they really did that more in the games industry it'd be just fantastic um i volunteer in prison teaching nonviolent communication and i see that happening there where um the men feel uh, very lost and very defensive, uh, especially against the system. And in our support group, uh, as we're learning together, they recognize some shared value to stand up for together. And often um, when they get out, they feel really, really motivated to work with supporting other men who have gone through the system and finding a healthy sense of community and something to stand up for. And it shifts their evolution into blue. I would like to underline two things Natalie has said recently, and the one is the absolutely essential role of red in seeing the need for boundaries, setting them and defending them. Where would we be without them? We would not even have cellular structures if we didn't have boundaries. We have to have boundaries where we are individual bodies and individual personalities, and we can't do that without red. Um, and it's one of the absolutely essential structures. And the other thing, Natalie, is you brought up NVC, nonviolent communication. And I have a re some real fire in my belly, some red fire in my belly about that. That is the one piece I would add to the integral toolkit. You know, I've read integral life practice. I use it. I go through it again and again. That is the one piece that's not in that toolkit that I would add that I think is missing and we need it. That is nonviolent. For those of you who are not familiar with nonviolent communication, it is brilliant. It is a way for working with all these issues and at all the, all the color levels. And it just cuts out all the mental chatter and goes straight to the core of the issue. And if we, it's a simple recipe for dealing with difficult matters with our inside ourselves and with others. And if more of us mastered this deceptively simple technique, we would be so much more powerful in dealing with all of this stuff. So that's my plug for NVC. And, and Natalie, I would love to see more NVC in Integral. And um, actually, I'm in the beginning stages of working on adapting NVC to Integral uh, to kind of uh, <clears throat> pull some of the feelings and needs and values into value structures and how there's hierarchy of values because right now NBC is a very green practice where no need is more important than any other and that's also not always true. Sometimes there's other things that way. Yeah, I, I will look, watch your progress and let me know if I can help in any way. Thank you. I Thank see. you very much. I want to interfere because I see Karen, the other Karen, wants to, to say something for a while, so I would like to give her space. Thank you, Heidi. First of all, um, NVC, I would love some information about where I could um, study that more, um, if there um, are specific areas that, that Karen and um, Natalie can recommend. I am not a sports person. I've never played sports but I am a political, or, and I am a political junkie. And I watch um, talk shows in the evening when I come home from work. And I have for a long time, and, and I really miss Bill Moyers. And I felt, always felt like Bill Moyers had a very integral approach. I don't know if you guys uh, had a chance to watch him, but he, um, he just was at a level where he, he had his own show, he was on PBS, and um, Heidi, you may have seen him a long time ago. He interviewed Joseph Campbell before he died. There was a whole series. Ah, yeah, that I saw. yeah. And um, I really crave that kind of communication and don't find it much on the, um, I don't have a TV, so I use YouTube and I'll go on MSNBC or CNN. And it's so, um, for me, it's so 
rewarding to find a panel of people who can have a discussion and disagree with each other deeply about what's going on in um, American politics or international politics and speak in such a way that um, the whole panel doesn't just go straight into red. And um, it's um, uh, and, and something we certainly need more and more um, in, in getting our news information. So uh, uh, periodically they will talk about something that's going on, say over on Fox on Tucker Carlson's show. And it's just mind boggling to me how that whole network is um, infusing um, their, their, their style and, and how rewarded they seem to be for doing that. Over and out. It is, you say that because I haven't watched American uh, media for five years. Uh, all my uh, information is from overseas broadcasts like RT uh, or Al Jazeera. You know what I mean? Uh, because they do have civil, uh, what I call civil discourse and um, cross talk and differences. You know, that's more like Bill Moyers, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm not aware, um, even on PBS today, uh, well, they have that in the States, but uh, I do know it's very rich in other countries. If you uh, pick it up on your internet, uh, those broadcasts, um, they, they still have that kind of civility in dealing with uh, sharing differences. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> just just a quick question for Paul. Paul, are you familiar with the game called Dota? I am, yeah. It's, it's funny. I, I, I'm getting more interested in games now because uh, before I noticed I wasn't that interested. Like, I, I kind of need to take it creatively. But, like, Dota is one of the few games I've played. I think one of the reasons is just because I guess you get to play against other people. Dude, we need to play Dota. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason why I, think I, I find it interesting, too, with the. Um, I, I felt a need to go back and talk about games for a minute just because we're, you know, two young guys who both know about games. But um, the thing about Red, I think, too, that I like about the games is that it's a balance between kind of like Red and developing Blue or Amber because it's, you have to balance the team aspect with the individual mm -hmm. aspect. And, you know, in Dota, it's my favorite game because it's so complex. I haven't played it since I was, like, 15, but you have different roles. And, and so some of it is, like, you do have, if you're the carry player, you have to be very red because the entire game revolves around you. But then you also have all the support players who try to like make your, you know, help you get to where, you know, so you can be more effective. So I think that that team aspect and also the individual aspect, you know, like, like um, Natalie, what you were mentioning about the prisons and, and it's almost like implicit in working with red, at least for a lot of us instinct, like even without knowledge of, uh, developmental theory we instinctively know that like amber rules and discipline and boundaries and and teamwork you know being oriented towards uh, the community is such a necessary step up so uh i really look forward to uh geeking out on dota when every um, just the two of us <laughs> well i was going to say as a person who's never done video games um do you guys have one to recommend that is a little more integral, a little less violent, and and um... there's um I think there's I, I'm I'm slowly starting to learn about it, but it's like there are I think different things that to cater to different things like um, I suppose a bit because I'm not sure I, maybe me and Ryan uh, or maybe Natalie as well I don't know maybe some of you older people <laughs> play games but like there's one for example which is The Sims which is basically revolves around like human relationships. So it's sort of like the gameplay is a bit like, uh, you can have like these grand narrative roles, like get married, have children, have the, the idea, idyllic family. Um, and I suspect there are, I, I would actually be really curious if there are integral game devs or things that are approaching it, because I think that would be fantastic. But I think there are, there's quite a lot of variety and I think it is evolving. A lot of games these days are becoming a lot more artistic and emotional. I think Green's fed quite a lot into uh, gaming, but um, I'm not. I'm not actually sure to be honest. But I'm, I'm very interested in it. Actually, Ryan, if you know, I think that'd be kind of fun to riff and be like, uh, or even if it's just Dota, to be like how it's kind of a muddle of like different things. 
I would like you who have suggestions, whatever suggestions you have, that you send them to me and I put it under the video so that we, everybody can, um, can see that. Because sometimes it is said, but it's not very clear. For instance, if I have understood the names right and so on, would be very nice who utters a suggestion to send me a short email and then it's printed there. Thank you. Okay, and then maybe Natalie, you and I can send a suggestion or two about nonviolent communication similarly. Yeah, definitely. Great, but I didn't want to interrupt you. That was only. <laughs> yeah. I think nonviolent communication, I don't know if everybody knows it, but that would also be a good topic to talk about you know, uh, a whole session and maybe who is very savvy as you seem to be to make a short introduction and then even practice it a little bit, you know, because I think that's all that, the, how do you say the devil is in the detail? That seems also nice when you read it and then you stay there and ooh, <laughs> how shall I do it? Uh, experience I had with a person who was studying intensely uh, nonviolent communication. The first year I met her, there was a guest here in my house, and that was fine. The next year, she had uh, adopted it to fortify her ego. So <laughs> that's also, you know, all tools can be used well and can be used not so well. So I don't think it's um, it is an exception. The higher level tools here to. So we have to be very aware. Yeah, I was, actually, I was curious about nonviolent communication. Maybe Natalie and Karen can say, because it sounds like you know better. But like my initial reaction was, I was like, man, it kind of makes me want to be more, more violent. Like uh, I was listening to it and I'm kind of like, I forget, maybe it was the founder, I'm not sure. But he was giving the speech and I was like, yep, I can see all the logic in that. And then there was this kind of this demeaning of people fighting over the truth like people getting really fired up because they feel like their way is the right way and all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, yeah, I know, but I kind of want to be that way sometimes. And even the name like nonviolent, like people have mentioned protection and fighting and boundaries and all this kind of stuff. Like it almost makes me wonder if, uh, if there's a, it, like, is violence a problem or is it at times a good, like, like it depends what you mean with violent that's why that's what i thought when i was exposed to nbc even though i could see loads of value to it as well yeah that's a very interesting point paul and i i just heard something about this more recently there's a big move to push to change the name to compassionate communication um, for some of the reasons you mentioned, also the reason that, you know, our deep psyche does not hear the word no. And so whatever you put up there, you're like, like just subtly power, but powerfully pushing violence by simply naming it nonviolent communication. But I'm told that Marshall Rosenberg, the founder, actually considered this very deeply during his later years. And he decided he wanted to stay with the term nonviolent because he affirmatively wanted to make that connection with Gandhi and Martin Luther King, who had developed some of the techniques that he was, he was absorbing to create the system. And he, he wanted that conscious link with Gandhi and Martin Luther King, who called it non, nonviolence. You know, that was the core of how they did what they did. So that's the historical reason why we ha we're stuck with the name. And Paul, did I understand you right? You said uh, uh, you were not sure why people are against violence and that it, 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 it the word violent and that uh, it depends on the definition. That would be also interesting to 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 figure out what do we understand? What is violent? That seems to be such a huge subjective. Um, um, scale of what people think is violent or feel is violent. Is there an objective definition for violence? Well, I have a perspective from my um, cornergetics and gestalt therapy studies um, that aggression means to move towards something or to reach out. And we have the connotation that it means violence. It means harming. And um, I think that you know, the 
the corner judge term is what Marshall Rosenberg was, is also, um, well, let me see here. Scratch the last thing that I was just saying. <laughs> Leave the definition. Um, that aggression can be very healthy. I think so I violence think is harming. Violence is harming. I think the discussion today has been all nonviolent. Hmm. <laughs> I think that's a I think that's a pretty great definition, actually. I, I mean, I would have a problem with, with harm being done. And Karen, hear, hearing your historical context, because it did make me think immediately of like, you know what, if you were working with certain levels, and to be honest, probably ones that, I don't know, maybe orange and stuff would be great, but like if you're working with it, like especially red, I mean, I could see why having nonviolent in like great big glowing letters is going to be needed. I think a lot of mine was just uh, backlash against green, really, because it's kind of like... Um, like sometimes it's green, it's kind of like you just want to run around with a katana and just be like, I want to slash through this thing because nobody could make a distinction or nobody's going to make a boundary. Um, so I think a lot of my beef with the, the nonviolent was it was probably just the green flavor of like what I was hearing. And actually the thing of um, uh, the violence is doing harm is a, is a pretty simple and pretty, that's a pretty useful definition actually because I think, I, I would think like everybody can kind of get on board with that. I'd, I assume, I don't know. Um, it reminds me of how green culture is very sensitive to microaggressions. And um, how, my, my thought isn't fully formulated here, so, so bear with me, but. Um, a way to communicate like where we stand and our emotional experience um, in making the implicit explicit um, without the use of microaggression. And it's trying to bring that microaggression to consciousness and interprets like all the subversiveness, the unspoken things as being aggressive behaviors. Um, yeah. I think this is a good uh, definition. But we also need to take into account that people, the response of people to, uh, to what we say is their problem in many ways. You know, you can have a very clear language and they still feel like offended or something. That's not our responsibility. You know, our responsibility is to do it as clear and as not violent as we can, but then we have no no, how do you say, no real influence because uh, on, on, on how they feel, you know. When you say microaggression, many things will be considered microaggressions by one person and by another not. So it depends always on the context and their background and their experience, what, what is considered as such. And I don't think nonviolent communication needs to take every single human being in their how do you say constitution or their their way of, of being in the world into account so we need also give them some responsibility in in perceiving what is said in in a, in a way which is not exaggerated or not i don't mm. know how to say that but well when we do nonviolent communication skillfully enough it cuts right through the heart of that it takes it brings it up takes it into account without getting lost in the thickets, but that takes a deeper and deeper level of skill. And with this, I very regretfully have to take off for another commitment, but I will listen to the rest of this talk with great interest and uh, look forward to uh, meeting with you folks again next Sunday. Okay. Take care, Karen. <laughs> um, so one more important thing with NBC is that, um, at its foundation, it's really a tool for self-empathy and doing our own inner shadow work. And when we become more clear about our motivating factors for communicating, and we can cut to the heart of the matter, we can, we can meet other with empathy when we've seen the things that are in our own shadow and recognize them in others. And um, NBC can become a violent tool um, when we use it as a, um, you know, as a thing that everybody must follow. And if you're not using that format, then, then you're wrong. Um, 
when we expect others to do it also. And, and I've also been um, at the receiving end of that. I lived in an NBC community and experienced a significant amount of trauma around the way that I was communicating wasn't in line with <laughs> the way that they wanted me to be. And um, so have, have gone in the other direction with uh, working with NBC in terms of self-empathy and showing up in that place of vulnerability. I'm curious how much uh, introducing the integrated, uh, integral um, uh, understanding uh, into your program, uh, because um, I know I'm working with that with a the therapy uh, modality, reading the integral perspective and expanding the therapeutic protocol itself by incorporating it, you know, and because um, I think my bias is the more integrated we are, um, as, a, as a person and the more we perceive the world moving towards more integration that the um, less violence, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, as an alternative, um, you start to choose, you know what I mean? Uh, um, so that, because I, think, because I think it's more organic, I think it's more in synchronicity with the evolutionary uh, process that I don't think that the um, all creation was to perpetrate violence. You know, I think it's a disruption of the integrating process and balancing process uh, that um, generates the violence. So it's interesting on an experiential level how you could take people in your program as you bring in more the integral. I'm not telling you how to do your program, but I'm just saying that um, it seems to have a very, um, when I've introduced it to um, clients and um, in the mental health uh, professional um, protocols, it seems to have some shift uh, with the person um, in a wholesome way, uh, even if they don't have a abstract theoretical understanding of integral. It, and I think, like I said last week, I think it's the um, cycle activation of the language itself, that it does something to the brain uh, or that moves it to an integration process or organic process. And man, I can't think of anything more uh, nonviolent than for us to become more organically whole. Mm -hmm. Another important thing that it does is um, teaches us to pause and become more mindful and in tune with our body sensations and not just our ideas about our emotional world. Exactly. Karin, you wanted to say something. Um, I, I was just saying, uh, I, responding to Natalie, thinking that she was in an environment that was in VC and she was not allowed to be authentic, um, you know, without being able to be authentic in any paradigm is, you know, <laughs> uh, certainly not integral and um, not very much fun for sure. I have, maybe this is the wrong time to slip it in because it's only the last 10 minutes, but uh, it may, I was thinking of like red, red or integral um, in a good way and a bad way. Like I often use <laughs> Andrew Cohen as a bit of a poster channel, but it's like, I see that as this very red interaction and curious about like what people's thoughts about it and expression. Like my take is kind of, if there's a negative red, it's probably like, you know, I am more integral than thou, or this pressure to be evolved, or something like this. Um, and a certain degree of, I actually think some red is needed. Like, I, there's been various conversations about the need for diversity, or to kind of somewhat bump up against the kind of authority figures of integral instead of people like having more disagreement and uh, creativity in that. Yeah, for me, a red integrated uh, is a healthy red. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I'm again, I like that concept of uh, transcending, you know, moving uh, to higher stages and include. And I like this conversation today very much because I've always been kind of shy about including the red part of me. Uh, that's why I've never had a history of gaming because I always thought gaming was uh, perpetrating uh, uh, a negative red. I mean, not that I spoke in that language, but. Uh, violence, uh, perpetrating violence. And this has been very, um, really uh, awakening for me and I appreciate it very much.
to see how you can put it in a perspective that allows it to be a healthy, uh, uh, like you say, feeling alive, forced. And, um, and I think it's really about incorporating that part of me um, that's part of my nature, was it the third level in the first stage of development, you know, the terrible tools, I call it, um, to, to uh, be able to bring it forth into the higher stages and levels of development. So it does maintain a healthy, um, or I respond to it in a healthy manner, you know what I mean? So um, uh, I, I, I just, this discussion to me has been wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know I'm saying to a closing here, but that's not my intent. Yeah. I, I just wanted to um, recommend some books on red, <laughs> non-integral, non-explicitly integral books that have really enriched my understanding of red. I'll, I'll uh, send out an email, but I'll just mention them here. Yeah. One is anything by Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche <laughs> is, to me, the most integral expression of red, even though he's definitely not integral. He's more of a disintegrationist, but uh, his what, what he was really getting at was how amber and blue Judeo-Christian, he called it slave morality, and also orange Socratic reason squelched our red impulses of like ancient Greek heroism and might and warriors and Achilles and that kind of thing. And so he wants to unearth red and unleash the beast, so to speak, by dissolving these higher structures within the suppressed red. So anything by Friedrich Nietzsche is really interesting. There's another book called Why Honor Matters by a philosopher named Tamler Somers. That was one of my favorite books in 2018. Very short book, but it's all about honor, honor cultures and how honor cultures, and he's trying to um, resuscitate honor cultures and encourage their making a comeback in society and has uh, talks a lot about red in a very interesting way that um, I've never read and mixed with like blue, but um, he talks about it in a way I never thought about and the importance of honor versus dignity, which is more of like an orange uh, phenomenon. But honor, he said, one of the val chief values of honor and that pride of like honor culture, like if you mess with my family, I'm going to mess you up, you know, that kind of like mafia kind of thing is it, it allows people to gain more status or like more virtue um, by, by, com by continually accruing more and more honor in the community. And you can't necessarily do that with dignity. Dignity is something like you have to defend. Like, this is my dignity. I'm going to be a dignified person. You know, please, please don't offend my dignity. Like political correctness in, in green, don't offend the dignity of a certain group. Uh, but what he was saying with honor was that it's, it's, it's kind of like a carrot approach. It's like you are motivated to do things in the positive to compound more and more um, prestige from the community. And the third one is a, is a book called Hillbilly Eulogy by J.D. Vance. And this is a, an account of how this guy growing up in um, Kentucky and Ohio in this really like hillbilly, like redneck culture in America and how um, the tension that the, these communities have between red and amber and how the red center of gravity really kind of like pulls them down. They feel very ashamed about that and that led to a lot of voting for Donald Trump. And that, so it's a very, those, that's a very fascinating uh, biography of what it's like to grow up in a very red uh, hillbilly <laughs> kind of community. Mm -hmm. So I, I love reading books because um, I, I can only talk to so many people and have so many life experiences, but the book is like a condensed experience that expresses a certain stage. So it really enriches my understanding of each stage. Uh, it helps me to get in contact with that in, in myself too. Yeah, I think we are five minutes to half hour, so we do that as a closing round, I think. So you want to start closing, did you say? Yeah, yeah uh, oh. you already okay. have done practically your closing now, <laughs> right. Ryan has done his closing, so we other left, four left people need to, need to if we want to. Do a closing. And I won't come last, so <laughs> I give you the precedent. Well, this has been a very interesting discussion. Um, I'm feeling a, a red uh, bubble inside of me today and um, kind of want to just get up and run out the door and run a couple <laughs> of times and run it once. And so this has been helpful to share that. Uh, with everyone and, um, you know, go back and think, 
and, and remember the, the healthy parts of red and integrating it. As a child, I was uh, not supposed to get angry, but I was also very much not supposed to be sad. And sadness was actually worse than anger, uh, raised by a very fierce mother. And I can appreciate now her fierceness because, you know, you fuck with me, you know, you or people I love, and I, I can go red easily. And yet, you know, not being comfortable with that and, and really having done a lot of shadow work over the years. Uh, and, and yet in the last 24, 36 hours, it's really come up. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to um, listening and um, to my inner voice and journaling and, and taking you guys with me. So um, in my head in this conversation. So thanks for giving some space to this. Um, what's in my mind and heart as we're closing is the connection between red and narcissism and that that's really been the, the thing that's kept red in shadow for me. Um, mm. I feel like I'm not afraid to speak up for the things that I value in that, in that healthy way, but that, um, yeah, I still can't quite put my finger on it, but I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of something with that that level of narcissism that red embodies and how to how to do it in a healthy way and even it comes up here in this circle so it's a it's a thank you for this playground to be able to um experiment with some of the these topics and this power in me um with you and and i have a lot to digest so thanks um it's funny i was, I was kind of impacted by what you were saying last week because it makes me think of a thing I've had this week of, um, I guess, dealing with the narcissism. Like, maybe this is part of moving out of green, but like catching myself being incredibly childish or really entitled and narcissistic, you know, actually sitting with that and being like, mm, no, I am actually doing that. I'm not just not getting my needs met or whatever. Um, and then I think generally, like, I think red is a massive, massive part of like something I really want. And also uh, some of the very like, deepest painful parts of my trauma and also like um ways of like not connecting with people with therapists and stuff i think there was a big red influence in my childhood that was incredibly unhealthy and i think a big part of me wanted to and still wants that red but then my family feels very squashed for various reasons so to have to be on the call and just have everybody kind of represent so much diversity and intelligence about how varied red can be and how vile it is and also at other times uh, destructive just feels um i feel kind of heartfelt and also a little bit like karen was saying like just really fired up especially in relation to when it can actually be engaged in the world like in some kind of action that various people were talking about and for me that's uh there's going to be a quite a lot of joy I think in running with red in the games industry or, or my interest in games so um yeah it just felt really meaningful and kind of fun and enlivening on the more light fluffy side of it yeah so to me this uh, conversation made me aware how I still have to integrate more my red because it's really a difficult topic for me because it was really very much suppressed. Also, it always came out, you know, and uh, it, I didn't have a healthy way to, 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 to develop it. Also, I have done a lot of, lot of shadow work and things, but talking about it, I realize, especially in setting boundaries, I'm setting boundaries too late. I let people do and do and go on. And then when it's too late, then, you know, and, and that's not good. So I feel in many ways still very green in many <laughs> actions of myself and not yet able to, to have integrated um, the red on a, on a second tier level. And that's, I'm really grateful for this topic. And I would suggest that next time in some way we continue, if Natalie and the other Karen, if you would do, for instance, a, an introduction to nonviolent communication, and then we put that together, violence, aggression, harm, harming other people, what we figured out today, how we can 
get that uh, little straighter. That would be a good idea. Is it okay with you, Natalie? Sure. Um, I'd love to invite my friend Xander, who um, does this for a living. He teaches NBC, and he has a lot of really healthy values that are not so green and more of the integral side. Um, so um, is that is that okay to you to invite him along? That's for perfect. That? And send us also your, your email address. Uh, and when you send me the note, uh, do you have my email address? I don't. Um, I can jot it or maybe Ryan can forward it. Yeah, Ryan, do forward it. Yeah, okay. So I thank you really very much. It was a great talk. And I'm so happy that you are coming and that we are talking about these things. It's really, thanks. And you will find the recording on the on a page on, on my website, thewisdomfactory.net slash integral, I think then minus and chats. And I will also put it on the main site so that people can find it. And then there I will put all the resources. So for whatever discussion we have, you have resources, I will put it there and then you will find it whenever you need it. Okay. Right. And you can also invite other people to come uh, talking or also listening afterwards, because I think it's very valuable what we do, especially when we have then a sort of a guideline where they can follow what we are talking about, nonviolent uh, communication at a certain point and things like that. I think that's very, very, very helpful. Thank you and see you next week. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so for much. putting this together. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.